folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so hello and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill and I'm the coordinator for this series. We have partnered with the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP, on this National Climate Assessment Forest Series. And my co-host on this series is Katie Reeves, Engagement and Communications Lead for the USGCRP National Coordination Office. And here are a few logistics for today. There are two presenters, so we will allow a few questions after the first talk, as long as we can get started on the second talk at half past the hour, to give time for the second presentation. Um, and then we'll allow time after the second presentation for, both, for questions for both speakers. Please type all questions into the chat box. If you are interested in getting a PDF copy or a recording of today's presentation, Katie will list the relevant websites in the chat box, or you can contact me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov. If you are not on NOAA's weekly science seminar list, but you're interested in getting onto that list, please email me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov and I will add you to the list. Folks in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And now Katie Reeves will introduce the seminar and our speakers. Katie? Great. Thanks, Tracy. And thank you to NOAA for hosting the fifth of 11 installments of our webinar series focused on the findings of the fourth National Climate Assessment. Uh, as Tracy said, I'm Katie Reeves and the Engagement and Communications Lead for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. Uh, the Global Change Research Act of 1990 mandates that USGCRP assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. And one way that we do that is through the development of a quadrennial national climate assessment. The fourth assessment was released in two volumes. The first, the Climate Science Special Report, was released in November of 2017 and covered in an earlier webinar series, which can be found on our website, www.globalchange.gov slash engage slash webinars. And I'll share that uh, link in the chat box shortly. The second volume, Impacts, Risks, and Adaptation in the United States, is the focus of this series. As the title indicates, NCA4 Volume 2 assesses the observed and projected impacts of climate change across the US, covering 17 national level topics in 10 regions. The assessment was released in November of 2018, and you can read and download it at nca2018.globalchange.gov, and that link I have already shared for you. Uh, today, I am pleased to introduce two of our authors, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Payne and Dr. Andy Pershing, as they present on oceans and coastal communities in a changing climate. Dr. Jeff Payne is the Senior Executive Service Director for the Office of Coastal Management with NOAA, and under his leadership, the nation's coastal management activities are coordinated to address the significant challenges affecting our coastal communities. He previously served as the Deputy Director of NOAA's Coastal Services Center, and during that time, he also led the Southeast and Caribbean Regional Team, a NOAA-wide effort to improve the value of NOAA services to the Southeast region states, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands. From 29, or 2009 until 2010, he served as the Acting De Deputy Chief of Staff for NOAA. He was Deputy Director of NOAA's Office of Policy and Strategic Planning in Washington, D.C., and served in the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President as the Budget Examiner for NOAA and the Marine Mammal Commission. In addition, he also served a year in the U.S. House of Representatives as the American Geophysical Union Congressional Science and Engineering Fellow. And Dr. Andy Pershing has served as Chief Scientific Officer for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute since 2014 and continues to run the Ecosystem Modeling Lab. Prior to this role, Andy held a joint appointment as a faculty member in the University of Maine School of Marine Sciences. His research focuses on the causes and consequences of changing conditions in the Gulf of Maine, and he's an expert on how climate variability and climate change impact the ecosystems in the Northwest Atlantic. Andy has also worked primarily on zooplankton, especially rice grain-sized crustaceans called copepods. I think I'm saying that right, but he can correct me. Uh, but he has also studied lobsters, herring, cod, salmon, bluefin tuna, and right whales. He's actively involved in regional efforts to understand and adapt to climate change. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us for today's NOAA Science Seminar. And I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. OK, well, thank you, Katie, and good afternoon, everybody. Or Good morning, depending on where you are. Um, Tracy, as well, thank you for organizing for NOAA hosting the seminar series. And I think this is really a great opportunity given the significance of the work in the Fourth National Climate Assessment and um, what I consider to be a, a tour de force of work that has been done by a whole host of people that have uh, given a lot of volunteer hours to uh, support the topic of a change in climate and assessment of its effects. So it's, it's a pleasure to have Andy with me today to talk about two of the chapters within the uh, fourth.
that we had other uh, team members on the Coastal Effects chapter, which I was uh, one of two uh, federal coordinating lead authors for. Uh, my co-federal coordinating lead author was Dr. Billy Sweet uh, with NOAA. Beth Fleming with the Army Corps of Engineers was our chapter lead. Uh, and then we had six other chapter authors. Uh, Michael Cragen with the Environmental Protection, Ag Protection Agency. Uh, Juliet Finzi Hart with the U.S. Geological Survey. John Haynes with the U.S. Geological Survey. Heidi Stiller with NOAA. Uh, Ariana Sutton Greer with NOAA, and then Michael Crook, Crook with the uh, National Centers for Environmental Information, and NOAA was our editor. So he actually kept us honest through <laughs> all of this. So, next slide. All right, so this is about climate change. That's what the whole purpose of the uh, congressionally mandated every four years uh, assessment is about. And if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to introduce uh, a couple of key points here about what is happening with our global climate. Uh, one of those involves temperature and the nature of temperature change through time. So what this graph shows is that uh, global mean surface air temperature has increased um, over the last century plus by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, specifically since 1901. Now this is the warmest period in modern history and it may be that you've heard about the Anthropocene that is the time during which people have had an impact on the climate, uh, on our Earth for that matter. Um, and this is a time in the Anthropocene during which we have seen a significant amount of changes, not just the explosion of society and the changes that we've gone through, but also uh, the changes in our climate. So what you see here in terms of uh, the temperature trends is this is from a multi-model ensemble, uh, blended ocean and uh, land surface uh, mean temperature combined. And the orange shading, if you're interested, is just the standard deviations around the different uh, multi-model ensembles that show uh, these trends. So the point here is that this trend is expected to continue over time because uh, emissions uh, into the atmosphere of greenhouse or uh, greenhouse warming gases will continue uh, with the current trends that we're seeing, if not accelerate. And we can expect that we will continue to see temperature increase. So, next slide. So, the, um, the next kind of general trend, and which will be a common element through the things that I will be talking about in the key messages that, uh, that I want to share with you, is about sea level and the changes that are happening with global mean sea level, but also relative sea level change um, in areas around, especially the United States, because the assessment does actually pertain to uh, what's happening within the U.S. So with rising temperature, we have rising seas. I hope most people are aware of what is behind that. There's the physical factors that promote that with a, uh, a warming ocean. We see uh, expansion of sea, sea water, and then we also uh, are having inputs from ice uh, that is accumulated both in ice shelves, glaciers, Greenland, and Antarctica in particular. So the top graph in this slide shows what is the observed and reconstructed sea level over the past 2,500 years. And if you see that uh, time just prior to the year 2000, you'll see the uh, change in what is occurring with uh, sea level. And then if you uh, kind of bring that down and expand it into the lower graph, the bottom uh, graph is showing projected mean sea level for six uh, what are called sea level rise scenarios. And these sea level rise scenarios are based on what are called represent representative concentration pathways or, or greenhouse gas um, models, essentially. And there are six of those. And these are designed, essentially, for the purpose of informing decision making. Uh, it gives us some idea about what uh, trends can be expected given uh, the different scenarios for greenhouse gas emissions uh, looking into the future. So the current trend, if you look at the line from 1800, yeah, 1800 on through to 2100, is that uh, we have had a relatively flat line consistency. And then uh, around uh, the year 1950, we see some uh, small trend upward, and then a more accelerated trend uh, that we expect after the year 2000. So uh, the current trend in sea level rise has been more pronounced over the last 25 years. 
Um, and this also shows that if we were to uh, go with a lower emission scenario, for example, one of the two lower lines, either the current trend or uh, what's called the lower intermediate low uh, scenarios, uh, we would see at least probably a foot of sea level rise by the year 2100. But uh, it cannot be ruled out that there may be as much as six to eight feet of sea level rise by 2100, especially if we do see pronounced uh, continued global warming and the implications for uh, sea ice melting, uh, or rather land ice melting and, and uh, introduction into the sea. So we're projecting that, generally speaking, we're likely to be in the range of about one to four feet of sea level rise by 2100. And uh, certainly from the observed uh, standpoint, what we have in empirical information, we've seen seven to eight inches of sea level rise over the last uh, 100 plus years. Uh, where I live in Charleston, South Carolina, our tide gauge down there has shown over a foot of relative sea level rise uh, in that area. And that's a combination of both what's happening with mean global sea level rise, but also uh, local effects. They could be oceanographic effects, they could be uh, subsidence, uh, just a range of things. Uh, Louisiana is another area where subsidence is a, is a relatively large contributing factor in the relative sea level rise that's occurring. So, next slide. All right, so my chapter and, and my co uh, authors in the chapter uh, was about coastal effects. Next slide. And what I wanted to uh, show here, in addition to the text, which you can read, is, is that this process, and this was the first time that I had gone through it, I've been well aware of it, uh, but it's the first time that I had gone through it. And it's an incredibly robust and uh, what I would call it a very high integrity process. Uh, it's not like any kind of scientific inquiry where uh, you, you may be setting up essentially a hypothesis, but you're going to work through the scientific method. And you're going to ensure that if you're doing an assessment, that you're looking at the latest and greatest uh, peer-reviewed and credible authoritative literature that you can pull uh, your findings and, and your assessments from. So this does have, uh, as a process, a high degree of integrity. So what we do uh, process-wise is we go through a literature review. And if you look at the citations in the back of the Coastal Effects chapter alone, they're well over 100, 150, I think we have at least. Uh, there are uh, opportunities for interaction with uh, stakeholders and with scientists and with coastal practitioners in particular. Um, we're looking to, in this process, essentially characterize and, and assess uh, everything from the, the conditions and, and the risks and vulnerabilities, uh, but eventually getting to some articulation of the impacts, what we can expect with a changing climate looking forward and to profile those and document those, and then to try to assign a relative level of likelihood of the changes that we expect, and it could be different scenarios, uh, but also the confidence that we have in, in how we uh, attribute you know, those changes to, um, to going forward and, and how it is that decision makers can kind of have some sense of, well, is this just you know, good of science, or is this something that actually I do need to pay attention to? Um, one of the things we do is develop key messages, and we'll be going through the three key messages in the Coastal Effects chapter. Andy's going to be doing a similar thing with his presentation, I'm sure, um, signing this uh, likelihood and confidence um, measurement. And then there's a section on traceable accounts. Uh, this is a whole section at the end of the chapter, which is really about documentation uh, and the credibility for what we have done. And then there's also a huge amount of review that these... Um, these studies go through, these assessments go through. Uh, there's a review by the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which is a very formal process and provides information back to the chapter authors about how to improve or change things if we have something that doesn't look right. Um, there are reviews by the agencies in the federal government because this is a federally mandated report, uh, so we go through that process. And then there's a public review process as well. So all of those comments come in. It's like anything that the federal government might do through a federal register announcement where you're proposing to do something, when the comments come back in from the public, you have to basically tackle each and every one and say, okay, this is what we would say about your comment. Your comment is great. We're going we're to include it and, and or your comment maybe um, is of concern. And here's why we think it is not necessarily something that we we can't work with, but we have to justify essentially all of those comments. So next slide. All right. 
So, um, key message one. Um, now, the, these key messages are, are really kind of important because when you're doing an assessment, you have you know 20 different things that you talk about. But the USGCRP and the process that has been followed for at least the, the last number of national climate assessments is to develop these key messages so that we have a, a constrained universe. We, we focus on the things that we think are most significant, most credible, and most useful, essentially, to decision makers going forward uh, and looking at how you know, climate is changing and the impacts of a changing climate. So our key message one, uh, and this is where we spend probably most of our time, um, but and I spend more time talking today about key message one, is that due to primarily the impacts and influences of sea level rise, uh, coastal economies and property uh, are already at risk. Not will be, but already are at risk. We're seeing the conditions change uh, today. So we essentially have in the United States of America, in the coastal regime, about a trillion dollar coastal property market that is at risk over time, including infrastructure. Uh, sea level rise, uh, higher storm surge, um, precipitation events, which could be uh, related to tropical storms on the east and Gulf Coast, for example, or otherwise a changing climate. With a warming climate, we have more water vapor retained in the atmosphere, thus more precipitation, extreme precipitation events, added on to these other influences like a chronically higher level of sea level, uh, which re relates to a higher storm surge. So under the um, what, again, the representative concentration pathways, these global emission scenarios, uh, the highest one is RCP 8.5. And under RCP 8.5, we are expecting that uh, coastal communities, especially low-lying coastal communities that do not have much topography uh, from mean high, high water uh, moving upward onto the land, will in fact begin to be transformed by the year 2100. And even under RCP 2.6 or 4.5, which are lower emission scenarios, um, we're still going to see significant impacts uh, to uh, real estate, to infrastructure, to societal uh, norms. And one of the things that we also try to do in the assessment is to basically outline what we would um, consider to be uh, adaptation and or mitigation options which might be considered in order to address um, what we uh, will see as, as these changes. So what we want to do uh, or suggest here for decision makers um, is that we need to start to plan for and adapt to more frequent, more widespread, and more severe coastal flooding on a regular basis. Uh, and, the, and the reason for this is that we need to manage and or decrease uh, the losses that we will expect uh, to our real estate, to our, our economy, uh, but also the cascading impacts uh, to the basic societal systems that we depend on, the lifelines that we depend on. Next slide. So one of the um, most pronounced areas due to a, a rising baseline of sea level is, is what's called recurrent or nuisance flooding. And we've been documenting this now for quite some time. Just last week, uh, NOAA put out through uh, Dr. Sweet's work uh, the latest information from 2018 on the uh, frequency of shallow coastal flooding related to an increased uh, sea level tidal flooding. Uh, and looking forward to 2019 for the projections of what we can uh, expect to see. And just a note, uh, Billy Sweet will be having a seminar here on August 8th on that report that was released. OK, great. Yeah, and this is really uh, useful and important information for uh, decision makers, but we have a high confidence that uh, the frequency and extent of tidally induced uh, shallow coastal flooding is indeed increasing. Uh, Billy has done a good job, as a, have other authors, of documenting this. And in some circumstances, uh, looking at places like Charleston, like Miami Beach, Fort Lauderdale, uh, places in New Jersey, uh, Annapolis right here uh, near to D.C., is we've observed anywhere from a 300 to 900 percent increase in the number of sunny day recurrent nuisance type flooding, tidally induced flooding days uh, over the last 50 years. So mm -hmm. now over the last five decades, we've seen that kind of an increase. So just the number of days where shallow coastal flooding has become an issue. <clears throat> so these graphs, one uh, on top is from Charleston, uh, modeling Charleston, the other is San Francisco. Uh, the orange part is basically ex historical exceedances above a shallow coastal flooding threshold, which is 
largely uh, defined by the weather service um, in terms of, of where things actually do flood. But this shows the, the days that would, looking forward, uh, it, it be flooded under different uh, the RCPs. So RCP 8.5, which is the highest emission scenario, if you look at the year 2100, we're anticipating essentially that every single day, every single day in those two cities will incur shallow coastal flooding related to an encroaching sea level. And then if you look at even 2040, let's use uh, Charleston, for example. That's the upper graph. If we look at 2040, that's just 20 years from now. And then go over to even the current trend, uh, that is the blue line. We're going to be seeing probably anywhere from 45 to 50 days of shallow coastal flooding each year. Okay, So this is significant in terms of just the nuisance of trying to get around, getting to work, driving your car through a foot of water. All right, next slide. So, uh, as I said, you know, sea level rise is uh, becoming a, a much more pronounced factor. It's a combination of storms, floods, uh, and erosion. It's a significant uh, risk or vulnerability that we have, and it's a threat to the wealth and uh, of what we have and societal well-being as well. So we have a high confidence of the losses that we were, are likely to incur and the costs that we will need to um, undertake in order to adapt or mitigate. Next slide. And this one just gives a little bit more um, kind of modeled information, the economic uh, analysis has been done. So under a high scenario, that is RCP 8.5, there is a 66% probability um, in this study of uh, this kind of magnitude of real estate loss. Anywhere from 66 to 106 billion, they could be below sea level by 2050, and 238 to 570 billion of real estate below sea level by 2100. And if you look at the uh, upper right, that gray box, that shows the number of homes at risk of chronic flooding. In 2045, this is from the, Univers uh, the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. And it demonstrates the impacts to economic sectors. Um, and if we're, uh, we're going to be thinking about you know, who's going to underwrite the kinds of adaptation or mitigation that we, we undertake, we have to think about the, the economy and how robust that is. So those that um, will be both impacted as well as able to assist would be things like developers, uh, lenders, insurers, uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, and, uh, and folks like that. So next slide. All right, and then this one kind of just wraps it with a little bit of bow. Uh, coastal infrastructure uh, and lifelines that we depend on are going to be impacted. Uh, roads, bridges, tunnels, pipelines, you name it. And it's not just what's happening at the coast, but it's also the upstream and inland impacts. So think about port operations. Think about uh, cargo vessels coming into port, offloading, and then needing to move their product to the interior of the country. Well, if there is chronic and everyday flooding going on, then that transportation infrastructure of moving those products and services into uh, consumers' hands in the country is going to be at risk as well. So it's not just coastal, but it's coastal and the rest of the country. Give them all the face. Next slide. Um, and if we are to uh, undertake what's called uh, adaptation, that is trying to uh, address uh, the threats that we have and to make modifications to the way we either approach things or modifications to the environment, the infrastructure, uh, we can see certain benefits. So this um, graph, uh, lower and upper, uh, shows costs of um, adaptation, costs with adaptation, and costs without adaptation. And it's hard to see with the graph, but I'll basically tell you that uh, under the high emission scenario, that is RCP 8.5, we're expecting that about $3.6 trillion um, of uh, coastal property uh, could be um, at risk through the year 2100, and that's without adaptation, compared to $820 billion with adaptation. That would be in the lower so this is a uh, this is work from EPA and others, and 
there's a, a stepwise nature to this graph, which might be of concern to folks. But basically, it's it's looking at the analysis of, of storm surge risk every 10 years. That's why it bumps up like that in the economic analysis. All right, let's move on to key message two. And I have five minutes, so I'm going to move quickly through this one. Uh, this one is about uh, our ecosystems. Uh, coastal environments are already at risk. We uh, depend on these environments for uh, you know, things like the health of fisheries, tourism and recreation, uh, human species health, public uh, safety, you name it. Uh, it's all dependent on health and coastal ecosystems. And we know that these are being transformed, uh, degraded, uh, and lost in some places. So we want to be able to pursue community and ecosystem resilience in order to uh, conserve and restore ecosystems. Next slide. And one of the major things that a lot of folks are working on these days, and NOAA is also a very strong supporter of this, is the benefits of natural and nature-based infrastructure. Uh, this is southern Florida. And you can kind of look at this and say, if a storm surge were to come up uh, through that area, I might expect that I'd be a little bit protected just because of the way that that natural infrastructure is in place. Uh, but natural nature-based infrastructure provides other co-benefits, including things not just like storm surge uh, protection, but also uh, habitat quality, water quality improvements, uh, recreation and tourism opportunities, and then uh, sequestration or collection of carbon from the atmosphere, uh, especially in marshes and uh, these brown areas. Okay, next slide. So this is key message three. Um, this one is about society. This one is about what we can expect is going to happen within uh, our social structure. What we already know, and it's not just because of this stressor, but because of lots of stressors, uh, coastal flooding is essentially exacerbating uh, pre-existing social inequities, not equalities, but inequities. Uh, and inequity, in my view, is like what's fair, what is an avoidable difference, uh, that kind of thing. So there will be questions about you know when uh, or if we are able to adapt uh, and or to relocate, for example, or migrate away from these uh, threatened areas. Uh, and then who will pay? How is this going to actually be managed as a social and or governance uh, question? And coasts are likely to be one of the first nationwide to test these changes and these assumptions. Uh, so we're looking at you know uh, climate relevant legal frameworks and, and policies that will come under uh, scrutiny. Next slide. So we know that uh, certain communities uh, do face uh, these perhaps uh, different uh, uh, or inordinate uh, threats uh, given their status. Uh, peer review studies are quite clear uh, that the socioeconomic challenges are being driven and intensified by a changing climate, particularly on the coast. Uh, look at the 2017 hurricane season with what happened with Maria uh, in the Caribbean. And then Katrina, going back to Katrina well over a decade, we have people that relocated to each and every of the 50 states from Katrina. And so migration did occur, relocation did occur, and it was under duress. It wasn't like all those people really wanted to leave. They just kind of had to in some circumstances. Next slide. So coastal communities um, also have, you know, these ties. Uh, we all have a tie to the place that we come from. We have a tie to the place that we're in. Uh, in many respects. And when you talk about migration and relocation, these are the kinds of things that we need to face. Um, so the cultural way uh, and life connections and communities are important. And this one shows the, um, the folks on the left side, part of the slide are the residents of the um, Biloxi uh, Chittimacha Choctaw community of the Old John Charles in Louisiana. They were the first ones to actually get, well, I don't know about the first, but they were the first ones to get a substantial amount of money from HUD in order to essentially relocate. That hasn't gone so well. They got nearly $50 million. It's been slow in, in moving uh, into their hands, and there are still many challenges uh, with how it is that they're going to manage their uh, relocation. But they are flooded out already. It's, it's a fact of life. Now. Um, so next slide. And the thing about uh, equity that I wanted to share with you, this little cartoon, we worked a long time on this, but it was a lot of fun to actually work through it. This concept of equity or this fair opportunity to adapt is, is essentially the way that I look at it. On the left-hand side, what we see, the resources are the boxes. And then you have three people, yeah, they want to see that boat out of sea. And essentially, the analog is that these three people uh, are at different levels of readiness to adapt, okay? 
If you look at the middle, now they have resources, all right? And those resources are being distributed equally. So it's kind of helped the guy on the left a little bit more. It's helped the person in the middle to actually see over the fence and see the boat. And the person on the right, nah, still, still not where they need to be. Equal distribution of resources. But if we look at it in terms of equitable, you know, what's fair, what provides an, a, a good fighting chance for everybody to be able to you know, deal with the changes that are coming? That's what you see on the right. So this is what you actually need to do, equitable distribution as a governance opportunity or option in order to reach the same level of adaptation. All right, I've got like no minutes left, so next slide. Coastal adaptation, range of things that we uh, could possibly do. Natural nature-based infrastructure is one thing I mentioned. Engineering, adaptation planning, uh, ecosystem repair. We can elevate homes, but what about streets? If you elevate the homes and the businesses, the streets are still at that level unless you elevate them as well. Uh, and then you can avoid, you can relocate, you can migrate as well. Whole range of adaptation challenges. Next slide. But uh, there's been very little investment beyond the planning. Uh, lots of cities these days are facing it. Uh, Miami, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, places like that are putting money, but it's going to be likely, looking at the high emission scenarios, uh, RCP 8.5, uh, to be insufficient. So uh, it's going to cost a lot to deal with this. Next slide, and I think that is the last one. Norfolk is one of those cities, this was our case study that we included within our chapter uh, to talk about some of the good things. Uh, positive planning, they're dealing with huge risks in Norfolk. They've got the largest naval base in the entire world right there on the coast, and people need to get to work each day in order to uh, serve the needs of, of that, uh, that DOD facility. Uh, but they're also thought and action leaders in, in Norfolk, and they have taken a whole community approach in order to address uh, what they're facing. So this maps out the different things that they're doing in their uh, vision for 2100 and designing the coastal community in the future. So uh, coastal effects, they're real, they're already happening, and if we uh, believe our own press and the studies uh, peer-reviewed and, and all the empirical information, it would suggest that we have a lot of work to do and we're facing still a huge threat. It may be a bow wave, it may be over the horizon, but it's coming. Thank you. So that's my story. Thank you, Jeff. We have a question from Elizabeth Blair. Does the report talk about wetlands resilience? Can Jeff say more about what's needed? And then we'll move on. Yeah, it does. Um, a little bit. The, the key message, too, was the one that we uh, spent a little less time on compared to the other two. But uh, wetlands resilience is going to be a factor in a rising sea level. Uh, scenario, depending on the aggressiveness of the sea level change, these uh, wetlands may or may not be able to keep up. Uh, erosion will be a factor as well. So uh, we do need to think about how it, it is that you know those wetlands will either continue to provide the ecosystem services, protect protective value, uh, or not, depending on the acceleration or pace of the change. Okay. So. Well, great. Thanks. And just because we're short on time, we're going to go ahead and move right on to Andy. You were fine, though. Okay. We, we took a little to your time at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Andy. All right. Can you all hear me? Yes. You sound great. Thanks. Great. All right. So uh, thanks for having me. It's really, uh, it's really great to be here and to get to represent uh, the uh, Oceans and Marine Resources chapter. Uh, so my name is Andy Pershing. I'm at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute here in Portland, Maine. Uh, if you do want to contact me, my info is there at the bottom. Um, so we've already covered the national climate assessment process, so I'm not going to talk much about that, although I will share some reflections at the end. Uh, but I'm going to walk through our, the main, main conclusions of our chapter from the Oceans and Marine Resources. So we had three key messages. One was uh, uh, ecosystem disruption, number two was climate-ready fisheries, and number three was heat waves and other surprises. And this diagram here on the right was what we put together to, to really try to capture some of the, the ways that we think about the ocean and the way we think about the connections that people in, of the United States have to the ocean. Uh, so I, I was really privileged to be on this team. Uh, I, it, it, you know, to be honest, it was one of the most um, 
I think, rewarding experiences I've had in my career as a scientist to, to get to work on the National Climate Assessment. So I'm really grateful to uh, to Roger and uh, Libby from NOAA, who, who asked me to be the, uh, the chapter lead for this chapter. Uh, but we had a really fantastic team. I'm not going to go through their names here, but uh, we, unlike the coastal chapter, we had a mix of both uh, federal employees and uh, and folks outside the federal system. Uh, and it was really fun to get to work with, with all of these different people. So the goal of our chapter, and we, we were really clear, we spent a lot of time at the beginning just trying to figure out, you know, what, what are, what's our purpose here? And of course, we had the guide, guidance from, the, uh, from USGCRP, but we really wanted to, to kind of say, you know, what, what are we trying to do? And the thing that we came up with was that we really felt like we, it was incumbent on us to try to make the case for why people in the United States uh, should care about the ocean, and specifically to care about climate change in the ocean. Uh, and because this is only the second time that uh, that oceans have had a distinct chapter within the climate assessment, so that was something that was in the back of our head all the time. The other thing that was uh, that was front and foremost for us was was our the focus on the drivers. Uh, we had the chapter one, the climate science special report uh, that identified for the ocean four main drivers of change: so rising temperatures, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, and then sea level rise. And uh, early on in the process, we negotiated with the coastal chapter and decided that we were not going to cover uh, sea level rise. We were really going to focus on those, uh, the other three processes. And we were going to focus more on the, on really embrace the, our, our, the marine resources uh, name in our, in our title. Uh, and so that was part of our goal. The other thing that we, we were very clear on was that we only had six pages. Uh, and of course, as we, as we went along, you know, the um, page limits uh, slipped, thankfully. But uh, we really were trying to keep this very, very tight as the guidance uh, from USGCRP was. And so we had to, right from the start, just give ourselves latitude that we were not going to be comprehensive, that we were going to try to be interesting. So we were really going to go through the literature and try to identify the three kind of most important uh, emergent ideas about how the ocean, uh, how climate change is impacting the ocean and how that's going to affect people in the United States. Uh, so early on, we, we, you know, we just said we are not going to cite everybody's paper. And once we did that, uh, we felt like the writing got a lot easier. So whoops. Uh, so uh, for our chapter, I'm just going to walk through the structure of, uh, of our first key message because it, in some ways it's our most important key message and also I think it gives a good flavor for the way uh, NCA4 was, uh, was working. So our first key message, and here's the, the full uh, verbiage, was the nation's valuable ocean ecosystems are being disrupted by increasing global temperatures through the loss of iconic and highly valued habitats and changes in species composition and food web structure. Ecosystem disruption will intensify as ocean warming, acidification, deoxygenation, and other aspects of climate change increase. In the absence of significant reductions in carbon emissions, transformative impacts on ocean ecosystems cannot be avoided. So just to highlight a few phrases in here, the first is valuable. One of the things that we were, we were all encouraged to do uh, through the National Climate Assessment was to, wherever possible, try to, val try to put valuations on the work that we were doing. Uh, so you saw Jeff do a lot of that with the, you know, the trillions of dollars that are at risk of, uh, in, coastal, um, in coastal communities. Uh, and so we, we were really trying to highlight that, that ocean ecosystems have inherent value, both economic value and cultural. Uh, here you see our three key drivers, warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. So why is this changing? How is it changing? And then the last piece is the what can you do about it? And for this, uh, for this key message, in some ways, we said there really isn't a lot you can do. The only thing we can really do to avoid many of these ecosystem disruptions is to reduce carbon emissions. And that's a message that came out very strongly throughout the whole national climate assessment, is that uh, if emissions aren't reduced, we're looking at a world that's a lot more costly and a lot more painful for the people of the United States. So now I'm going to uh, um, go to more of a shorthand view version of our key messages. And I'm just going to break each key message up into three components. So what's at risk, what do we expect to happen, and what can we do? And this is fairly consistent with the, the risk framing that we, were, uh, that we were led through as we developed our chapters. So our first key message, ecosystem disruption. Uh, at risk are the highly uh, valued and iconic habitats. We expect to see transformative impacts. 
and what can we do? We got to reduce carbon emissions. And as we were developing this key message, two ecosystems were really front and center in our mind, and those are the the ecosystems in the tropics, especially the coral reef ecosystems, and ecosystems in the uh, in the Arctic uh, that are uh, where where a lot of the productivity is structured around sea ice. And in both of these ecosystems, the reason we call it ecosystem disruption is that as climate change causes a loss of the structure of the coral, it changes the whole nature of that of that ecosystem. Similarly, in the Arctic, as you lose ice, it, it changes the whole productivity and structure of, of food webs in the Arctic. Uh, and so there really are these almost irreversible changes that uh, that we see coming out of the of the literature right now. Um, so uh, here's some of the evidence from uh, from the coral communities, and this was uh, this was work that was coming in really late in our uh, in our process, uh, driven by the 2016 El Nino and the global mass coral bleaching. So a lot of great literature that we could draw on for that. So coral, this uh, this graph is essentially just looking at at coral reefs around the world, looking at their temperatures, showing that they're getting warmer. Uh, and then showing that the return rate of bleaching is is decreasing. So rather than bleaching every 10 to 12 years uh, that was going on in the 80s and 90s, many many reefs are now bleaching every four to six years, even uh, even more frequently than that. And that's really challenging the ability of the coral and the other communities to essentially reassemble after the disturbance. So our next key message focused on fisheries. Uh, and of course, this is the easiest thing for us to value, and, and we really wanted to have fisheries in there because we can make that really strong economic case uh, that was that was important for the, the the goals of the climate assessment. So we have valuable fisheries and fishing communities. Uh, we expect to see reduced catches and loss of economic value. Uh, but here we actually felt like there was some opportunity for adaptation, and so we talk about climate-ready fisheries management uh, that can promote resilience. Uh, so we, we drew a lot on work out of uh, William Chung and Vicki Lamb's uh, group at the University of British Columbia. Uh, they did some really excellent modeling work uh, showing, basically projecting catch potential for large marine ecosystems all around the world, including those in the United States, at high and low CO2. So we can kind of contrast the benefit of reducing carbon emissions. Uh, but this graphic from our chapter shows in the yellow areas, which is basically everywhere, uh, reduced catch uh, catch potential uh, in the tropics. So you see the the U.S. Uh, islands in the Western Pacific, as well as in the Caribbean. Uh, you're seeing orange and red, so much greater losses, as well as greater losses on the East Coast. But what can we do about it? This is where we really wanted to highlight the great work that NOAA has done, uh, specifically the National Marine Fisheries Service Climate Science Strategy that has gone from a high-level strategic document to now uh, regional implementation plans that are being put in place at the uh, at the science center level within the within the regions, uh, and highlighting kind of the how you might uh, start to link up climate models, climate projections with management strategies, and identifying how you might begin to build climate resilience into the way that the U.S. makes decisions around its valuable fisheries. And one of the messages that came out very strongly from, from the literature is that well-managed fisheries are more resilient. So they, it, it's not perfect. There's, there's are limits to how, uh, how much warming or acidification or uh, deoxygenation uh, fish populations can tolerate. But well-managed communities are going to be more resilient, and that's going to be more productive. And our last key message was, in many ways, my favorite. And that's because it really felt like this was something newsy that we were reporting. Uh, when uh, the third national climate assessment was being put together in kind of 2012, 2013, that's when the first marine heat waves were beginning to be, uh, to be described. And it was the first time that marine heat wave, the, the term heat wave was applied in the oceanographic literature. And so that work didn't come on, it wasn't available to make the deadline for NCA3. Uh, so thankfully, we were able to draw on it. Uh, so at risk are marine ecosystems and coastal communities. We expect that extreme events uh, are going to increase and that they're going to reveal unexpected uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, but what we can do is we can monitor, we can forecast, we can detect, and we can try to predict some of these unusual conditions. And uh, we highlighted uh, the heat waves uh, in the in in uh, in our chapter. So we put together this diagram that showed the major heat waves through uh, early 2016 uh, in 20 uh, in 
uh, that were available in the literature as we were putting this together. So the 2012 ocean heat wave in the Northwest Atlantic and the work that Kathy Mills and uh, our colleagues have done looking at uh, the impact on lobster and longfin squid, uh, the 2014 and 2015 blob related events in the Pacific and harmful algal blooms and dungeness crabs and impact on, uh, on whales through entanglement risks. Uh, there was a, one that came in very late as we were developing the chapter around 20, uh, around um, uh, Alaska. And of course, these have just continued. So we had an additional heat wave in 2016 and 2018 in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we're seeing heat waves uh, for the second, I believe it's the second year in a row uh, off of Alaska. And so these are really starting to become a, a real factor, not just in the U.S., but around the world. But the really interesting thing, I think, is that these abrupt events often drive adaptation. So we see this in, uh, in a couple of ways. So on the West Coast, uh, in the early 2000s, there were some uh, uh, upwelling of corrosive water uh, into off the coast of Oregon, and that water ended up getting into shellfish hatcheries and really challenging uh, the aquaculture productivity there. And so there was a whole suite of technologies that were developed to manage the water chemistry in those um, in those shellfish hatcheries, and that that technology has been, or similar technology has been developed now on the East Coast to deal with uh, acidification that's coming more from the land side, from in increased precipitation. Uh, and in uh, in the Gulf of Maine, uh, we had this disruption in the lobster fishery in 2012 that led to uh, development of additional processing capacity to, to deal with soft shell lobster. A marketing campaign that I highlighted here to to help uh, promote the soft shell product. Uh, as well as some forecasting uh, work that that was done to try to uh, build a little, uh, give give a little bit of um, uh, forward planning uh, for that fishery. So I just want to have a few reflections, not so much on our chapter, but a little bit more on the process. Uh, and the first is that if you are uh, if you're thinking of uh, that you would like to have your work cited by the next authors uh, of the National Climate Assessment, there are a few things that I think that the, those folks are going to need. Uh, one is that they're going to need papers that, that document adaptation and its limits. We really struggled to find a, a, examples of adaptation in uh, uh, relevant to ocean ecosystems. Uh, and so in the future, that's work that I think will be, uh, that will be really relevant to future national climate assessments. Um, and I think we, we really were excited anytime we found a paper that ran, uh, that ran their models under both high and low CO2 because that allows us to, to be able to make that case for how valuable it, it is to reduce carbon emissions in the future. Um, and so finally, I, I really loved working with my team. I think we had a really fun team to work with. It was, I think, high, you know, really functional. Uh, we had a lot of fun together. And so I just wanted to reflect a little bit on some of the lessons we learned about group writing. Uh, and that's group writing is better when I think the group is correctly sized. Um, Roger was very uh, good at advising me at the beginning to pick a small team, that we really didn't need to have experts in everything. It was better to have a, a small team that really felt cohesive. Um, that uh, the process that you go through leads to buy-in. And so this is where we, we really gave ourselves license to be interesting rather than comprehensive. Uh, we went through a whole process that uh, that Roger and I developed that where where we were kind of brainstorming and bringing ideas to the table and then went as a group started filtering them down and combining things. Uh, and finally, uh, the group uh, our group did a really great job uh, embracing technology, uh, so using video conferencing, uh, using Google's collaboration tools for the documents, uh, things like Slack were really great for helping us uh, stay in touch in between our regular calls. And then lastly. Uh, if pets appear early and often in the process, it helps uh, with group cohesiveness. So uh, on our second call, uh, Alan Haney was um, joining the video call from his home office, and he had uh, his cat happened to wander in front of the screen. Uh, that broke the ice for the group, and so since then, uh, uh, about every second call, somebody would introduce a new pet, and so it became a running joke, and uh, running jokes are always great. So. Um, thank you. I'd, I'd love to take a few questions, and then hopefully um, Jeff and I can have a bit of discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. <laughs> Any questions for Andy? Go ahead, Holly. Um, so with a four to six year coral reef bleaching, what's happening in that interval? Are they, is there die off? Are the community shifting? Are they overtaking? Like what, what what, what is the recovery like in that yeah. four to six year interval? 
Yeah, I'm I'm not an expert on that. John Bruno, who was our who was our author, was the uh, was our coral reef ecologist. Uh, my understanding is that in many places they're 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 very challenged to recover, and so you're you're getting some shift in the community of corals from the many of the kind of branching species that are that are the big s kind of structuring species towards slower growing, more resilient sort of the mound or brain coral. Uh, that provide less structure for the, you know, for fish and other things. And then I think in some places you're also seeing algae start to take over in the wake of the, of the bleaching. Uh, but it's a, this is a real kind of global challenge going on right now. And, uh, and there's a lot of work, especially, uh, especially by the Australians who are really on the front lines. And then you can see Mark Eakin replied, there's been very little recovery in the hardest hit coral reefs. Oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Okay. Got a question coming in from Michael Leafman. Michael asks, is there a temperature threshold beyond which there is no recovery for coral? For coral, yes, I, b I believe there. I believe there is, and you know, Mark's Mark's online and might know it off the top of his head. But you know, I think you just have to think about the biogeography. There, there are. Th this is one of the challenges in the tropics, and you saw it in, in, in the, we see it in the coral story as well as in the fish story, uh, in that, you know, for a place in sort of a mid-latitude, species can kind of move in from the, from the south, right, from the tropics into the subtropics as conditions warm. In the tropics, there really, there isn't a warmer ecosystem that can come in and replace things. And so you're not, you really are losing functionality. And I think one of the things that our team wanted to highlight uh, was that all most of the effects that we've seen so far in ocean ecosystems and in fisheries are really being driven by temperature. We know that ocean acidification is out there. We know it's affecting species, but we, we weren't able to come up with any case studies where there's a real population level impact of ocean acidification. And so that's one where I think, you know, in the future, we're going to start to see that interact with temperature, and that's going to cause, kind of, come in as an additional stressor uh, in these ecosystems. Andy, were you able to look at, like, the effects of changing temperatures at the poles, like with seabirds and mammals, like the work of Devoki and all these other seabird guys and the mammal folks? Uh, we didn't bring that literature in very, uh, very carefully. I mean, there was some general discussion about the kind of the role of ice and productivity and the kinds of food webs that get supported uh, around I kind of I the ice, um, ice edge bloom kind of food web that, you know, very, uh, lots of intense new production, lots of export to the bottom, lots of, you know, productivity at the benthos and the benthic fish. And then, you know, that triggers up, tr that goes up the food web to things like walruses and uh, but we, we didn't, I think, bring specifically those stories in. And Mark Eakin replied about the corals, dead is dead. The difference is between mild events when coral bleach occurs but may recover. At higher temperature anomalies, the reef is dead and takes 10 to 15 years for a start of recovery but for fast-growing corals. The problem is severe bleaching is now returning in five to six years. So I read it just so that we can have it for the record, sorry. And Katie's giving us notes about how you can find all these chapters if you're interested. And Chip asks, did your chapter tackle the effects on seagrass communities? So that was, this is one where we, we didn't, we, we did not, there was a bit of, I would say, a bit of a gap in the National Climate Assessment around these kind of shallow subtitle uh, uh, communities, I'd say. You know, I think, uh, you know, Jeff and his group did a good job with kind of the the, the kind of the land side uh, of the of the coastal ecosystems. I think we were we were a little more focused on the perhaps the blue water, deep water kinds of things because that's that was where our expertise lay. And so this kind of estuarine uh, uh, and sort of salt marshes, I would say that's a that was a gap that we didn't uh, that we didn't get to in in the chapter. And that's something that you know perhaps. Uh, for the next NCA, there it might be an opportunity for that uh, for that group to kind of take on that ecosystem. Thank you both for your great presentation. So I'm just curious, what are, what are the action items? How are you delivering this right now? Where is the focus of your attention for um, 
getting this out and messaging to right decision makers? Yeah, well, so the U.S. Global Change Research Program has done a really good job of um, encouraging the report authors at any level, any anybody who worked on a chapter, to go out and take it on the road and talk about it. Uh, so we're hitting major meetings, for example, AGU, GSA, you know, things like that. Um, some of the uh, ecosystem sciences convention or uh, large conferences. So there is that. The, the other thing is, you know, as people who have worked on the report, you have a better appreciation, like kind of as individuals, for the significance of things because you kind of peered in. You really peeled the onion back and peered into this and, and said, "Okay, I, I'm a little bit more." not just convinced, but a little bit more concerned now than I was before. And so in your day job, you have the opportunity as well to do something good. And, and you know, I've taken that on personally. Uh, I, don't, I don't go out like screaming, you know, the sky's falling at all. But, you know, I do come with the facts in hand as best we understand them today. Can you approach Congress in any way? I mean, are you guys trying to reach certainly, out that way? Yeah, certainly. I mean, yeah. you, you know, I, I think that the science needs to stand on its own. As we, as an agency, you know, given the policies we have, uh, have endorsed as well, yeah. and um, you know, let, let the cards fall where they will. You, you need to say what needs to be said. Yeah, if I could jump in here too, I think so. We did uh, a panel at Capitol Hill Oceans Week, which gets to the NGO community, gets to some of the policy makers and a lot of congressional staffers, as well as a few, uh, you know, con congressional folks are actually there. Uh, and so John Bruno and I were on a panel presenting the, especially the, focusing on the ecosystem disruption key message. Um, but I've also, I've found the, the climate assessment products, both our chapter, kind of the logic behind it, the way, the, it, it's helped me to find a way to talk about the, connecting the dots between carbon mitigation, reducing CO2 emissions, and benefits in, in the ecosystem and things people care about. I found that to be a really great resource for talking to folks here at the state level. Uh, and so that's that's been something we've used myself and my colleagues uh, within the state uh, as we've worked with the state of Maine towards the Maine uh, actually going on a, a a pretty ambitious path to reduce CO2 emissions and the you know the the potential impact of warming on the lobster fishery and the connection between climate change and resources that people care about in the state was a was a big driver. Great. Okay, and then Renee Collini says to add to Jeff's comment, many extension specialists, outreach professionals, e.g. Sea Grant, Sentinel site cooperatives, are also developing products, messaging, and leading dialogues in local communities to share the information in the coastal effects chapters from volumes two and related data from volume one. That's great to know, Renee. Thanks for telling us that. Maybe you'll have to present on that here at the seminar. And great, I'll be in touch with you. Any other comments or questions? Katie, do you want to talk about next week's seminar? Sure, I can do that, definitely. Um, so first, I just want to thank you, um, Andy and Jeff. This has been really illuminating um, and helpful, I think, to everyone on the line. Um, and I want to take just a quick moment to um, give another plug to the NCA4 website, because in addition to the full content of the, of the report, which if printed is over 1,500 pages, um, we've developed do downloadable materials, including overviews, executive summaries from the chapters. All of the figures that you see in the report um, can be downloaded. And then there are even chapter-specific PowerPoint files. Um, I've dropped that link into the chat box a couple of times, so I suggest you check it out. Um, and I hope that you'll join us next week for the sixth seminar in this series, um, which will focus on transportation and the built environment with Libby Larson from NASA and Jennifer Jacobs from the University of New Hampshire. All right. Well, that's great to know about the PowerPoints, too. I didn't know that. That'll be really helpful. And these MP4 recordings will be up on the website as well. So thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks so much, Andy, for presenting remotely. I know it's difficult to uh, present with your cat in your lap, but it can't be all that bad. And thank you so much also to Jeff Payne. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you next week, we hope.